awesome. <laughs> Look at that. It is so cool seeing you. I've seen all, every single one of these videos and I love them all. I love them all. <laughs> oh, that's so kind of you to say. Oh, I love doing them, man. It is, I mean, just the fact that, you know, it, it's informative. You, you learn stuff about people. It's just fun to see old friends and be able to chat. Yeah, I know almost everybody. Uh, some are old, old friends. Uh, Margie Boulay, uh, she and I go back to uh, practically teenage years. Uh, Lou Frederick, uh, my brother Craig Walker. I mean, <laughs> just all the Jack McGowan. We got back in touch because of that. You're performing uh, great service. Well, thank you very, very much. I tell you what, I learned more about Jack McGowan in that hour than I have about anybody. I thought I knew, I thought I knew the basics. Man, is his story incredible? I love the part about, are, are we recording here? Yeah, we're going, we're rolling. This is excellent. It. Excellent. Hi, everybody. I love the part where he talked about a Paul Simon telling him to come to Oregon. <laughs> I, that is so cool. He was standing on a street corner in New York, and here's Paul Simon. And they get in this long talk, and he says, come to Oregon. And that was right around the same time I was deciding to come to Oregon, except it was Tom McCall telling me not to. Because he was the guy saying, come and visit again and again, but for heaven's sake, you know, don't come here to live. Well, that's and a great like. That was a magnet. Yeah, that was a great advertisement for the Jack McGowan episode. And now we've got a good tease for yours. Uh, yeah. I, I, I think I remember that the campaign was uh, uh, come to visit, but don't stay. Uh, and you had visited and loved it so much that you decided you had to find a way to get here, right? That's exactly right. I'd never been here. I was graduating from college. Uh, I had seven years of experience. I had some offers, some pretty big market opportunities. And I wanted to go to where I'd be happy and could stay a long time. And I came to visit a friend of mine who I'd worked with in Denver, where I was from. And I stepped off the airplane and into this May evening. And I looked around. And when you live here, you don't see what a newcomer sees. Mm -hmm. You don't see the trees. You're not surrounded by the flowers. You know, it just knocked me out. I couldn't believe it. And then an hour later, we're walking along the Oregon coast. And, <laughs> yeah. and I'm thinking, this is incredible. I've got to come here. It took me a year uh, to get somebody to look at me uh, or, or to uh, hear my tape and go, yeah, you know, he's all right. Let's hire him. And that happened to be KGW Radio. I'm so glad somebody at KGW just went, eh, we'll hire him because that started yeah, off yeah. a great relationship with you in the Northwest, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, born in Chicago, moved to Denver, went to school in Colorado. But uh, how did the radio stuff come? Did you, kn I, I mean, I remember, I've read what you said about you started as the, you know, basically the janitor at a radio station. Yeah. Did you know you wanted to be in radio? Absolutely. From age eight or nine, because my dad was in it. Uh, he founded the radio station at Grinnell College in Iowa. And uh, he talked about it nonstop. And I sat at his feet and I listened. I thought it was oh, so interesting. And at that time of my life, I had had a couple of freak accidents, uh, broke the hell out of my arm, did something bad to my knee. Uh, for a couple of years, I couldn't be in gym. I couldn't go out and play practically. I had surgeries. So it was me and the radio. Mm. And so I got to know the radio. And I, every single Chicago radio station, uh, I became a student of it. And by the time we moved to Colorado at the age of 12, uh, I had no doubt that that was what I wanted to do. At 15, I lucked into a job at a low, well, not a low power, but kind of a, a daytime, a daytimer, you know, the signs off at sunset. I was 15 and uh, I got a job as a cleanup boy which meant I had a key, <laughs> which meant everybody was going home at the end of the day and I would come in and I would clean up the radio station and then I would go in the studio and I taught myself the board. Mm -hmm. I taught myself how to run a radio show. I'd, I'd watch the guys, you know, through the glass and some of them took me under their wing a little bit and said, yeah, here, th this is called a pot and here's how you cue up a record and here's a cart. And that's about all I knew. 
And so I got in there and every night without anybody knowing about it, I would put on the earphones and I would do a radio show. It would not <laughs> go out over the radio. The transmitter wasn't on. That would have been federal law. But I got experience that way. Um, I caused problems for them. Uh, for example, <laughs> I didn't realize that on a cart, you could put things in sequence. You could have more than one thing on a cartridge. And so here's a cartridge that says noon news, open, close. Okay. I put it in the machine. I hit the button and here comes the voice. Time for KQXI news at noon. Here's the news at noon on KQXI. And I would read a newscast. And then I would take the cartridge very carefully and I put it back where I found it. And the next day at noon, they would hit that button and the close would play. <laughs> this has been the noon news at KQXI. Thank you for listening for the noon news. And now on with the music on KQXI. And this happened day after day. Clean up, kid. <laughs> damn kid. They didn't figure out it was a damn kid until the night I was irritated by the rumble of the wire machines. The AP and the UPI. Brr, 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 and I said, yeah. that's irritating. I went and I turned them off. Oh, no. <laughs> I forgot to turn them on. <laughs> so the, the next morning, the morning news guy came in and had nothing. No news. Uh, it, no news was bad news. It, it was bad news for me because I got canned. Oh, but, wow. By the time that happened, I had experience and I got hired at this big all news radio station called KBTR, which is the radio side of Channel 9, the ABC affiliate in Denver. And I was hired as somebody running the control board because I sure knew how to run a control board. <laughs> had to lie about my age to get the job. <laughs> uh, they thought I was in college. I was not. Uh, they thought I was uh, 20. I was not. <laughs> I was 16. Did you have your FCC phone license? Didn't didn't uh, need a didn't need a license yet. You only need I, that to run a transmitter. Well, see, I um I did a little bit of work at KVAN in Vancouver when I was in uh, uh, right after high school, college, and I think I did like the overnight thing uh, a few times. And because I was there in the transmitter, I had to actually go down to the FCC office in Portland and fill out some form. They said, you have to have a license. And I said, I don't know. Yeah. To get a radio, a, a telephone license at the FCC, basically, you just had to be able to write your name on a form. Basically, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, that was, and that's when the, the K-Van studio was out in this field right below the tower. Right. And I, I actually had to, you know, twice a night check to make sure that the frequency was right and that the light yeah. on the top of the tower was on make the readings that was, make that was the requirement of a, a radio license that's all i had to do yeah make sure the light is blinking and, and, and so the airplanes all. don't hit it oh yeah yeah well we're sure lucky that you found portland and kgw found you those were kind of, those were the golden those were the good old days of am radio in portland weren't they it was such a blast it was such a blast. KGW was a great radio station. Um, I'm so lucky to have worked there. So lucky to have encountered the people uh, that I worked with. Uh, success I've had in my career is, is all because of the people I worked with. Uh, Bruce Murdoch, yeah. you know, what a funny guy he is. He was like 20 years old uh, and, and he was doing mornings at KGW and they put me in there with him. He was the original breakfast flake, I think, is was their uh, was their tagline for him. It's a breakfast flake, super talent. Uh, kind of got me out of my shell in a way because for seven years I've been this you know hard rock news guy and 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 I was still doing that, but also things outside the newscast with Bruce. And then Bruce went to King, and they took the midday guy and made him the morning guy. Boy, was and that that, a, that was a mistake. That who who made that call? That would never work. That would never work. Craig Walker, Walker. Are you kidding me? in morning drive. The first time I heard Craig, uh, I was in my Volkswagen driving to Portland, moving here. And uh, around Pendleton is when you can start to pick up KGW. And I'm thinking, okay, what am I getting into? And he was unlike anybody I'd ever heard. Instead of this kind of macho image that AM radio was portraying, he was... Um, conversational and warm and uh, light uh, in his sense of humor and had a nice touch, perfect timing. He worked over music like he was a member of the band. And I thought, this guy is really good. And this is not a rocker. This <laughs> is a grown-up radio station. 
And uh, boy, and then when he came on to mornings, he had to evolve a little into being a morning guy uh, because instead of doing middays where there's lots of music and not a lot of talk, it's kind of the opposite. And uh, so the program director uh, at the time, great PD named Mike Phillips, went on to fame and fortune, one of the best PDs in the country, uh, and was from Portland, and he was the program director at the time. And he coached me to uh, kind of get Craig out of this midday groove that he was in and make him react more as a person and maybe make him a little bit mad from time to time. <laughs> and, and so I he had a teeny tiny bald spot and I would make fun of him and he'd go like that a little bit. And, and, and so, and, and, and we'd start playing verbal ping pong back and forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he took right to it. And, um, and, and, and we just went back and forth and, and, and we developed a rapport. We developed a sense of timing. Um, you, you know, we're, we're very, very different people, but we have a lot in common. His dad was in radio. Yeah. My dad was in radio. Um, we both come from those kinds of roots. We're both really serious about it when we're doing it. And, uh, and, and, and we just clicked, clicked, there's a great word, um, uh, and, and from the word go, from the nice. word go. I, uh, I remember sharing with Craig, who I see every once in a while, because he has a house here near uh, where I live now, Black Butte Ranch. And um, I have told him that the day that he took over for Bruce Murdoch, uh, right. uh, and, and Murak was there doing his last show and Craig, they kind of introduced Craig and they kind of did a, a show together there. I was listening at home before I went to high school. Yeah. It would have been like my junior year in high school. And I can remember, <laughs> uh, Murdoch was leaving and here was this guy coming and I, and I'd seen Craig before because I had done a tour of the station with uh, my junior high class and had gone and watched him do the middays. Right. So, um, I, I was there at the beginning of Craig Walker in mornings with you, John Erickson. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and he just grew and grew and um, what a superstar, what a talent. And, um, and he changed over the years um, early on, uh, you know, it was a pretty straight ahead morning show. Yeah. Uh, so uh, there were some mainstays of that uh, morning show that you guys eventually took to the FM as well. As, that's where you started Stump the Jock, right? Yeah, yeah. Now, Bruce started that. Okay. So yeah, did you he guys... made that up and, uh, and Craig inherited it and we uh, turned it into an institution. I mean, for, for decades, people would uh, figure out where they're supposed to be on the way to work by Stump the Jock. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. It came on at 7.30 and boom, that was time for Stump the Jock. And we did other things too. Uh, Stump the Jock was the, the heart of, of <laughs> what we did. And, and we had a great news department. Um, it was a kind of scary good news department. I, I, in that news department, I had Mike Beard, uh, Lou Frederick, Dave Paul, uh, Cheryl Marshall, uh, who went on to 17 years at KGW television and who is also the mother of my children. And we've been married 42 years now. <laughs> That's uh, funny. I remember I was working with Cheryl because she was on the assignment desk at KGW for all those years. And, you know, working with this genuinely a very nice woman and very news competent woman. And it was five or six years before she, she, we were talking about something. She said, yeah, I, I was Cheryl Marshall on, on the radio. And I went, well, really? I used to listen to you. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't put the two and two together. Uh, yeah, well, you know, and that was a, that different time in radio when there were huge juggernaut news departments in radio because KGW had your guys, uh, KEX, uh, I think KUPL, yeah. uh, KXLY. I mean, there were, there were fiercely competitive news departments in radio that were yeah. staffed all day long with, with really good news people. Yeah, KYXI uh, was all news. KEX was incredible. Jim Howe was great. Yeah. KPL with Neil Penlin and, and those people. Uh, KPAM, the original KPAM, KYTE, K was, was the former uh, KOIN. They all had great news departments. But I had Lyle Arthur. I had Lyle Arthur as my trap, as a street reporter. And uh, it, it was awesome. Great team. Uh, and Lyle went on to be the traffic guy for many years for you and Craig. He was. And then when I left, when I went to King 
in 1980, uh, he became the morning anchor. Uh -huh. And so Craig and Lyle were a team and they were incredible together. I tried to bring him back when we all went to the FM um, in the mid eighties. Uh, I, I just about had Lyle convinced to come back and join us. I would have loved to have had him there. Uh, he has passed on now. He uh, died about five years ago, I think. But uh, what a great guy, what a talent, and what stuff he brought us, traditions. A at Christmas time, uh, you know, we asked him one day uh, when he first uh, started, uh, so what do Hawaiian people do at Christmas? Do you have any songs that you sing? <laughs> <laughs> and he says, well, funny you should say. And the next day he brought in his ukulele <laughs> and he taught us Mele Kaliki Maka. And we play Mele Kaliki Maka every Christmas for the next 40 years on the AM, on the FM. Uh, it drove our program directors crazy because we weren't very good. But the <laughs> listeners loved it. We had people um, who had moved out of town who would call home to friends and they would hold up the phone to the radio. Others who lived in Seattle would drive down to Olympia where they could hear us just to hear Mele Kaliki Maka. Um, didn't he, uh, after he left, it was, it was home in Hawaii, he would yeah. always call in for that event every year in December, I think, so you could do exactly. it. Exactly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the Christmas show every year. Mele Kaliki Maka is the last thing I did on the year when I retired. Really? Uh, in December of 2019, yeah. We did, did a retirement show. Uh, Murdoch and I together retired. And Mele Kiliki Maka was our swan song. Too bad Lyle couldn't be there with you for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Always in our hearts. So, uh, you know, radio at that time in the 70s and 80s and early 90s was, was so much more connected to the community than I think it is now. Now there's so, there's so much, uh, you know, just generic ownership of radio stations across the country, but you know, KGW was either sponsoring something in the Rose festival or the bite someplace or, you know, Mount Hood jazz Festival. you, you saw these radio stations and KGW specifically involved in everything. And, uh, you know, and, and, it was before digitized music. It was before CDs. It was before uh, Spotify. So that was this connection to our lives as far as the music of our time, but also a connection to what everybody was doing in town. That, that was just a great thing to be a part of. Absolutely. Oh, it was so much fun. And I don't know if we knew at the time how lucky we were. Those were the days of local ownership. Yeah. By and large. Uh, KGW is owned by King Broadcasting. What a great company that was. Uh, I spent 10 years with them. Um, and Dorothy Bullitt and her duo, two daughters uh, became kind of friends of mine when I worked in Seattle. Mm -hmm. And it, they cared so much about the communities and, and for the people. And there was such loyalty there. And there was just so much that we could do that you can't really do when you're owned by a company that's in some other city and that, you know, Portland is not home, but it's a market. And it, it owns it, it, 80 uh, radio stations across the country. There's no difference between that one and the morning news guy there than there is in, you know, Charlotte yeah. or Dubuque or, or Minneapolis. It's, they, they're... Things change with the times right and, um, and, and it was frustrating but in a way I understand because things do change and as time went by some of the things we love doing we're getting trimmed back we lost stump the jock mm -hmm. you know be, because you know program directors in other cities would hear it We're not even playing discs anymore. And so, you know, it went away. Yeah. But it, but it was all right. It was acceptable. So how many times, well, I guess let's get to the, the shift to uh, K103. Yeah. Uh, I, it was interesting for me to learn. You had, you had left town. You were Seattle. I think you might have been in Houston. Yeah. That Craig was thinking about leaving and was kind of playing out his contract. And he kind of teased that station saying, get John Erickson and, and yeah. then I might go, go there. And you kind of on a leap of faith changed cities and jobs again, didn't you? I didn't like Houston one little bit. 
um, uh, I had two little kids. I wanted to raise them in the Northwest, not in Houston. And I think by that point, uh, the management and I had parted ways. Uh, I stayed there a year and a month. It was time for me to get another job. And I had some opportunities, some major market type opportunities. And I had learned by that point that in your really need to get to a major market, you need to get to a major station. And there's a big difference there. Um, you know, major markets, New stations can be good, bad, you can have a future or not. A major station in a market like Portland, um, th that is potentially the key to a stable and happy future. That was my theory. That turned out to be true. Um, at that time, uh, K103 was owned by uh, a, a family or by a company headed by somebody named George Johns who is a, a, a consultant and a programmer and the person who pretty much designed the adult contemporary format. And part of his style was to find the morning show in the market that was the number one morning show and pay whatever it took to get it. And that's what he did. And in Portland, it was Craig Walker. And so they came after him hard and they were offering him the likes of which had not been seen in this market. And, um, and that was the time that Craig said, hey, talk to John. He is not happy in Houston. In fact, he's probably out of work. You'll get him for a song. Um, <laughs> what a great agent. <laughs> yeah, great agent. Um, and it was a little bit of a leap of faith, but I didn't think that King Broadcasting was going to meet what was being offered. I thought that he was going to move. Yeah. And, and I was right. And so I came in December of 85 and Craig... Uh, had to eat up his no compete in, uh, and he came in September of 86. And, uh, and we just picked up exactly where we left off. Yeah. It was, it, you guys recreated that magic that you had at one station at another. And then all those listeners stuck with you guys for yeah. a decade and a half. I mean, just for, cause I remember being at Craig's final show when he did it at the, uh, at the, the the banquet hall there in Portland, and yeah, the governor yes. hotel, and and, and all those people, you know, they all looked like me. They were all in their forties or fifties or whatever, and they had been with you guys for several decades. That had to be heartwarming. Yeah, yeah, we'd been through so much together. You know, part of the evolution that Craig made, and and me too, I guess, as as years went by, is that we lived out our lives uh, on the air. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, as his kids uh, grew up and played soccer games and his mind did the same, and my son played baseball and football at Lake Ridge and he'd have a good game, he'd hit a home run, I'd come and talk about it the next day. They graduated, they went to college. When I drove my son to college in Minnesota, I did live reports from the road on the way just for fun. <laughs> uh -huh. and, you know, we, we just kind of lived out our lives. And then Craig... Uh, develop that liver disease. Yeah. And so that whole process was something that we shared with the listeners that he well, did. Yeah. Was, you mentioned that because I was in the studio with him and a camera the day that he told his audience. I remember what, that. What had happened. I mean, he, he was kind enough to let us know ahead of time and we were there. That might've been the most emotional professional day I ever had uh, yeah. to hear a, a man of that stature uh, and a friend and a colleague yeah. and to be there with you. And I think maybe Craig's son was there as well. Um, yeah. Announced this life challenging event to the community. Uh, like I said, th that was the most emotion I felt ever as a professional in my business. You know, he made that announcement uh, as he did most of the things that he did on the air through his career directly into my eyes yeah because we worked face to face through glass but we were always in eye contact and i think that helped both of us communicate on the air but that was so intense uh, i knew i knew craig was sick yeah. and he did tell me what was going on um and when he made that announcement though it, it brought such power uh, and, and such a feeling of, of emotion to me 
that after the show, I just, I got in my car and I went up to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. I just cried. Mm-hmm. I mean, and, and I knew it was possible that he would not make it, yeah. that it all depended on that liver transplant. And um, when he got the call, he wasn't uh, in Portland. He was in Palm Springs on spring break. And uh, the great Tom Parker was filling in for him. What a talent. Yeah. What a great guy. He has since uh, passed on. But uh, Tom came in and filled in. And uh, Craig flew up for the transplant. And uh, I was and am close to the family. And uh, I spent the day up there at the hospital, first uh, waiting for all the preliminary tests that had to be done and whether permission would be granted, whether he was medically cleared to undergo it. Um, I happened to find out that the answer was yes. And I happened to tell the family that it's a go. It's going to work. And they're hugging and crying. And then I went in to um, not free up, but in some room where Craig was sitting on a table uh, with my tape recorder. And I said, Craig, what do you have to say? Yes, I remember. And he did another one of his just eloquent, um, it's amazing. The guy's facility with words, even when he was desperately ill, he never yeah. missed a beat. I mean, he looked terrible, but he sounded great through the whole thing. And the last thing he said to me, you know, I, I, I said, I'll see you on the other side. And he looked me in the eye and says, I'm going to be there. Mm-hmm. And, and he was. And, and not the, only the was he there, day, yeah. he's still here. He is a medical miracle. That yeah. transplant yeah. Uh, has, you know, obviously changed his life. But to, every time I see him, it's like, oh, it's 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 just this yeah. greatest uh, uh, confirmation of of that whole transplant system and donor relationship. And it's uh, it's so yeah. nice that it has turned out the way it did. And then you mentioned him. Uh, you guys making that announcement on the air. It was the ultimate confirmation of what you guys did over the years is is you you were yourselves and you had a relationship with those listeners that was honest and true. And if if that's the case, then you can do what you and Craig did that day. If if it if it if it was fake, if it wasn't real, that couldn't happen. But because it was true and honest, that was the the biggest affirmation of all these years is this is the value we have together, you two and the people who are listening. That's a really profound insight. Thank you. I, th- I, I think that is true. That is true. I have to think about that. But, but, but yeah, it was what we did was right in character because we were that honest, you know, with everything on the way through. And, so, and, and now I see him. I actually I haven't seen Craig in over a year. Yeah. Or, well, no, we did, we did. We took Malikiliki Maka and we turned that into an internet thing. Okay. And now. so we got together at, yeah, around Christmas okay. and we recorded it. A, a Zoom Malikiliki Maka. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Do you remember the last time you and I saw each other? No. Was it Craig's last show? Uh, no, it was after that because uh, not being a big concert goer myself, but my wife and I got... Uh, bought tickets to James Taylor and Carol King when they were in Portland. This is more That's, than a decade ago, and we you we, sat right behind us. No, right next to you. We we right walk, next to us. We walk in and sit down, and and these weren't comp tickets that you got from the station. We you know we paid for our tickets. Right. We sat down, and there was your wife Cheryl, and I looked over, and there's John Erickson. That's the we're going to James right. Taylor with these guys. <laughs> I remember that. I remember that. Hey, I heard on your podcast that you kidnapped Kenny Loggins. Supposedly. I, I was not convicted. <laughs> you were not convicted. You're innocent. I, I had my own Kenny Loggins uh, story. Great. Um, part of the job was to uh, do uh, concert intros occasionally, and I introduced Kenny Loggins at a concert. Nice. And uh, this was at the Clark County Fair. And I show up to do the intro and his road manager, manager, whatever it was, motions me over and says, okay, get over here. I said, hi. He says, you think you're going to introduce Kenny Loggins, right? And I said, yeah, I guess that's the idea. He says, I'll tell you what, if you say the words, ladies and gentlemen, here's Kenny Loggins, I am going to castrate you. <laughs> that was unexpected. What? 
apparently he has a pre-recorded intro where he would bring his guitar onto stage and, and do a self intro. That's fine. I, I don't care. I've introduced a lot of people. I, I just don't need to be physically threatened with violence. <laughs> so castration. What, what did they have you do at any, anything at all? Uh, yeah, I, I went up there and I've talked about what a nice evening it was and what a pleasure it's going to be to hear Kenny Loggins and uh, thank the people for coming and got off the stage. <laughs> I, I did another concert intro at the Clark County Fairgrounds. It was for McDonald, Michael McDonald. Yeah, from the uh, Dewey Brothers. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and I was afraid I was going to forget his name. And I get out on the stage. It was a beautiful night. It was packed. And I opened my mic. And I almost said, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ronald McDonald. <laughs> oh, but I didn't. <laughs> But the words were right there. Oh, yeah. Well, that, I, funny you should say that because I got to tapped once to um, introduce, it was the Broadway series at Civic Auditorium that KGW was sponsoring. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it might have been K2. I don't know. One of the two stations that I worked at. Um, and I was the station representative to introduce something. And I just had something short to read. Uh, but it was a, it was a, a musical uh, compilation of Andrew Lloyd Webber's work you know, right. Phantom of the Opera and that kind of stuff. Sure. And so I was going over in the car when my wife and I were driving there. And twice I said, Andrew Lloyd Wright. Oh. And, and my wife goes, honey, that's the architect. That's the architect. <laughs> so <laughs> I, <laughs> boy, was that in my brain as I was walking out there to oh, do, you know, man. and I don't say right. Don't say right. Don't say right. <laughs> <laughs> and if, if I bet if I hadn't, I've said it in the car and my wife had not corrected me, I would have screwed that one big time. <laughs> that was a fun thing to do though. I, uh, Julie Emery and I together introduced John Denver for his last. Cool, spent time with him backstage. That was fun. Uh, back in the day, I introduced Blood, Sweat and Tears. <laughs> <laughs> they were great. <laughs> I, I bet they were. I bet they were in those yeah, days. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, you have come to the end of that wonderful radio news career. Uh, what was the decision that made you decide that it was time to, uh, to retire the dulcet tones of John Erickson? I had let them know about two years earlier. Um, and I gave them a date, I think, which was a year earlier than I finally did. And they said, could you please wait um, <laughs> for another year? Because we want to kind of get a replacement in mind and uh, and we're just not ready to have you go just yet. And I, I was happy to go along with that. Um, uh, we had a great general manager named Robert Dove and uh, he, he looked out for me uh, over the years, took great care of me. Uh, I was aware of how lucky I was to have a GM uh, that I could talk with mm -hmm. who was from Portland, who believed in me and Bruce and what we did. And uh, so when he asked me to stay, I, I certainly did. And uh, so another year went by and, it, and, and we just finally figured out it was time. They, they had made enough changes in the morning show that it wasn't recognizable uh, really to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it, it was still fun. And I feel like we were still doing pretty good radio. But by this point I had three granddaughters, and they were more important to me than anything else. Um, you know, we had sort of taken care of the nest egg a little bit, so I didn't really need to keep on doing it. Um, there were a couple of aspects of it that I, I didn't really want to do at all, um, namely commercial endorsements, mm -hmm. which is something they wanted us to do. As a news guy, I can't do that. No. Um, and, and so I was in a kind of conundrum there. And just between that and also being of retirement age, um, that's what led me to do it. And, and Bruce was in pretty much the same place. And so we retired on the same day. Oh, how, a cool way to go out. Have you, uh, as, has your body adjusted to a normal sleep schedule after 30 some years waking up early in the morning for the morning drive? Yeah, yeah. You get up at three in the morning 
uh, you're lucky to get six hours of sleep a night. I had a doctor tell me early on, young man, you need to stop doing this for a living or get another shift. Otherwise, it's going to kill you. That's one of the reasons that I stopped too. Yeah. But that doctor is dead and I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> and he was probably getting nine hours and a nap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now I'm getting eight hours. I get up at six every morning. Uh, we have puppies uh, and I feed the puppies. And uh, then I, I do a, a news blog on Facebook. The Daily the Drip. Daily Drip. The Daily Drip, yeah. Which is a, a fun thing to do for me. It started as a memo that I would write to myself every morning before I went in about here's what's going on in the news. You know, I'm just doing my read up in the morning and I would send it to myself, but I would post it on Facebook too, in case anybody had any comments. And it started to gain a bit of readership and more and more people started reading it. And somebody gave it the name, The Drip. And by this time, a few hundred people were reading it and they called themselves The Dripsters. And it fine, it was fun. And it grew and grew. And uh, when I retired, I was pro probably going to put it you know, to an end at some point. But then the pandemic happened. Yeah. And people were out of touch with each other. People were isolated. And on the Daily Drip, uh, it's, it's a closed community uh, in that only if you're a Facebook friend of mine can you comment. And so there are 5,000 people who do, um, uh, but, but I can exclude anybody. I can kick anybody out. Uh, and I, I think that's a good thing because I won't have uncivil behavior. Right. I won't tolerate trolls. I won't have people calling each other libtards. You know, th that kind of stuff is an automatic ejection. <laughs> <laughs> and I throw them out and I have a waiting list of hundreds of people wanting to get in and be dripsters. And nice. I vet every single one of them. And if there's something on their ball, on their wall or on their about that would indicate they're going to be a problem, uh, I don't let them in. And so it's become a community and it's a community that gets together. Uh, we have uh, kind of every two years or so, we have a gathering called Drip Stock. <laughs> and, uh, and, and there are lifelong friendships that are formed and I really enjoy it. Uh, I, I, I enjoy the companionship sure. of, of people on the drip. Well, when this episode airs, you're going to have to put it on the daily drip so we can uh, get all those people to know about there's the, an idea. the PDX media, good old days, including John Erickson. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So do you, uh, I noticed the tuba back there. You're still playing that. Does that band still exist? The one more time around band? It does. It does. It's, it's uh, taken a bit of a hiatus, I think, for a couple of years because Rose Festival has not been able to do mass events. Right. And so the Starlight Parade and the uh, Grand Floral Parade are out. That is great fun, though. I'm a terrible tuba player. I'm, I'm really bad. Um, but, I, but I'm good enough to play Louie Louie. You know, every time you see There's them. There's safety in numbers in that band, right? Absolutely. There's 500 people in there. Every, every time you see the band marching along and the drummers are doing the cadence and the band starts holding up two fingers. Two fingers means that they're going to play Louie Louie. That's the, the signal to the band that Louie Louie is what we're doing next. And I can play Louie Louie. It's so <laughs> much fun. You know, you're in the, the starlight parade and it's a mob scene and a happy crowd and you come around the corner from Burnside onto fourth and there's a parking garage and it's packed with people and you strike up Louie Louie and you hear the just roar of the crowd and you feel like the Beatles. Uh -huh. <laughs> it is so much fun. It's so much fun. So I do that. I do what you do. I play the guitar. Um, <sighs> well, I, your tuba playing and my guitar playing are probably on the same plane. <laughs> I bet you play it for the same reason I play mine. I, I play it for my own entertainment. Uh, yeah. I, I, I don't generally let other people hear me play it. But I've, I've, I've got a Martin in, you know, regular tuning and I've got an Ibanez in open G tuning and I've got a, uh, I've got a Gibson electric guitar and I'm constantly out on the deck just wailing away. We live out in the country. I don't have any neighbors. <laughs> I've caused dogs to howl in the distance, but that's it. Well, it's interesting you mentioned the, uh, that great parade, the Starlight Parade. Uh, I was never really a parade guy ever. Yeah, I just wasn't. And then one day they they threw me out as the 
you know, the sideline reporter for the parade coverage. Yeah. And I, and I, I've never had so much fun and enjoyed an assignment as every year I was asking to go back. Can I do that? Cause you know, uh, you know, you're talking to people on the side, you're talking to people while they're marching, you're getting to see the one, my one more time around band. Uh, I, I just, I became a parade guy just like that from that starlight parade. And, uh, those are always great assignments. Yeah. That's a great night in Portland. I can't wait for it to come back. It's too soon. Maybe yeah. next year. Well, John, this has been a lovely uh, reminiscing uh, event. Uh, I, I, I guess the last thing I wanted to ask you is now that you're retired and you're not, you know, on the air every day, how many times at the grocery store does somebody say, you got a great voice for radio? <laughs> that happens. <laughs> well, except they can't hear it because I got my mask on. Oh, oh I, I forgot can't. about that. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, thanks for spending time with us in the good old days, because uh, you were certainly a major part of that in radio. And and it's always always fun to to hear the stories that go along with with all the things that we uh, were listening to when when you and Craig and you guys were uh, doing your your wonderful radio show over the years. So all the best to you and to Cheryl. And I hope those uh, grandkids keep you really entertained, John. Yeah, I love them so much. I'm a 100 uh, percent the total immersion, uh, immersion grandpa. You're whipped. <laughs> yeah, totally. totally. John, oh, thanks, thanks for the time, buddy. Goodbye. Okay,